Okay, so uh, today is the 14th of June, 2022, and we'll talk about two architects, uh, um, both from North America. If by North America, we understand the United States and Canada, and not just the United States, as commonly, uh, you know, people are, tend are tempted to, uh, to think. So we begin with the Canadian, Arthur Erickson, uh, and um, let's read a little bit about him. Arthur Charles Erickson was born on June 14th, and this is the reason we talk about him today, was a Cana Canadian architect and urban planner. He studied the Asian languages at the University of British Columbia, and later earned a degree from McGill University School of Architecture. He is renowned for designing some of the most recognizable buildings and sites in Canada, including Roy Thompson's Hall, Robson Square, the Museum of Glass, and the Simon Fraser University campus. He also built some remarkable um, um, private uh, residences. But I would uh, underline the fact that he first studied Asian languages. I think this was very important for his uh, professional biography. Not only that he started by, by, by studying uh, languages, but Asian languages. So I think in touch with a language which was very different from his and with a culture which was very different from his, uh, uh, enriched his uh, understanding of the world, of um, even of architecture. And I, I actually, uh, in an ideal world, I would think that the architect would benefit a lot from uh, studying some, something else besides, besides architecture. And this is also what uh, Yanis Xenakis thought so too. Actually, Yanis Xenakis thought that the architect should have a second job, another job to do two things, not just architecture. Because there is a problem when you, when you are too involved with architecture and only architecture, you risk of becoming obsessive uh, and uh, kind of self-involved, and that's not good. Anyway. Uh, I begin uh, sometimes with, uh, with a picture, the way it, it downloads or, or uploads, I never knew uh, exactly how to say correctly, if uploads or downloads. Anyway, this was the man. I like him very much in a, in a, you know, as a younger man, and we'll see that, that picture. Uh, but as an accomplished architect, he looks you know, approximately sharp and a little bit cocky. Here he is, this picture I like of him, you know, as a young man who, you know, not too long ago uh, was studying Asian languages. And you can tell from his face that there was a certain in intensity and even sensibility. This is a model of a building that he built and we are going to see it. Some drawings by uh, Arthur Erickson. Uh, you know, nothing very special or very personal, you know, our architects uh, very often can do such drawings without being celebrities. But he also had utopian uh, visions, so to speak, like, uh, like this drawing. And I would encourage uh, young architects and students of architecture and uh, even older architects to explore, you know, even in an utopian key, some of their dreams, I think is important. I know that uh, its majesty, the reality principle doesn't encourage us to do so, but I think a certain idealism is absolutely necessary in order to breathe uh, properly and sleep well as an architect, to, to arrive at a certain level of accomplishment to express your creativity. In other words, even if society doesn't care about your creativity, you should still assert it, in my opinion. Drawings from the Canadian Architectural Archives, layered landscapes. Now we begin with this house from 1955. So, uh, you know, almost 70 years ago from Vancouver. Um, uh, and, uh, Unfortunately, I don't know if I have, I don't have great pictures with this particular house, uh, but um, we are going to see a few of his houses and they were quite good. And he benefited, of course, from a, a remarkable landscape uh, uh, of 
often, uh, if not always, dramatic. Uh, but even in this uh, black and white picture, you can see, um, you know, a uh, convincing form of modernism and, uh, you know, uh, benefiting from, a, you know, always generous uh, nature around it. Now, the Filberg residence, 1958, British Columbia, um, these are not, uh, were not, uh, you know, houses for proletarians. No, these were, you know, uh, opulent houses for uh, those well-to-do, for those who uh, afforded uh, an architect who also knew Asian languages. And bravo to him that he also knew, and I, I really think, and I reiterate, it would be great if architects knew something else besides architecture perhaps even in, in depth, you know, as I imagined he did with the Asian, uh, Asian uh, languages. Anyway, houses, houses, houses. Another one in Alberta, Canada, 19, 1960 and not uh, 960. Um, these, of course, they are not considered uh, by Wikipedia worth mentioning, but I think these private residences uh, are an important part of his oeuvre. And uh, I actually think that even a diploma after six years of work could very well be a private residence. It doesn't have to be a big building. It could even be a cabanon to refer to the 16 square meters of Le Corbusier, which he did when he was, uh, you know, uh, uh, almost at the end of his uh, life, meaning a very mature and accomplished architect. What I'm trying to say is uh, architecture is quality, it's not quantity. You know, just, just because you make bigger and bigger buildings doesn't mean that you are more, more uh, you know, uh, knowledgeable about architecture. You can show your skill even within a very small building. Now, this is not a very small building, but it is a private residence. And I think it, it has, it has uh, qualities in uh, what we call, uh, in the field of what we call uh, modernism. Canada, uh, a country where several good architects were, um, you know, encouraged by society to, to uh, find, uh, you know, accomplishment in their field. And I would include here also the Romanian Dan Hanganu probably the most accomplished um, uh, Romanian architect ever. Uh, if, if by accomplishment, we mean, uh, you know, the number of significant buildings that he built. Graham House, West Vancouver, 1963. This is one of the best houses I think he built. And uh, maybe, you know, someone might be interested to, uh, you know, uh, address a possible parallel or uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, study of this building and uh, Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, because both buildings, uh, although they are very different, but they also have things in common. You know, assuming the water, the water here enters underneath the house, uh, just like uh, the Falling Water in a more dramatic way does for the Falling Water. Uh, it's, this is a good building by, by Ericsson, and uh, I wish I had, uh, I have other pictures, but I'm still not happy with all of them. Uh, nevertheless, what do we see here? We see nature, we see the building, we see the work of God, and the, we see the work of man in some kind of uh, an harmony, uh, and uh, an harmony through contrast as well, but, co but, but harmony nevertheless. And one is not overwhelming the other. And I think this is important. Whatever, you know, Winnie Mas, the main designer of MVRDV might say, because he said, you know, he talked about outsmarting nature. I, with all due respect, and I like Winnie Mas, and I like the works of MVRDV, but, but these are foolish words. What do you mean to outsmart nature? Now, <laughs> When I, I kept saying it, and I will keep saying it, uh, when Frank Lloyd Wright was asked if he believes in God, he said, I do, but I spell it nature. Well, this would mean, uh, ref reflecting on the words of Winnie Mas, that he wants to outsmart God. Now, these are not very modest 
words, are they? Anyway, um, architects are known for not being very modest. If you are very modest, don't become an architect. In fact, it might not even be possible. Um, anyway, this building is, is good. It's good by, um, uh, by uh, Arthur Erickson. And uh, it has a complexity. I mean, I wouldn't mind at all if I lived here. In fact, I would love it probably, you know, to continuously navigate between various spaces at various levels and, uh, you know, have continuously a dialogue, a visual dialogue, and maybe not just visual with the nature around. It's, it's good. But again, this is not for anybody. This is for someone who, you know, afforded. I mean, imagine just a, just a piece of land here, you know, which, which is almost edenic. Anyway, another building, but this one is a, a large building. Uh, it's an office building from 1965, so almost 60 years ago, British Columbia. And I think he shows clearly his, uh, his uh, skill in handling both private residences and large uh, office buildings like this one. And, and he does it in, in uh, distinctive ways. Uh, even the grid and the repetitive square could achieve uh, nobility and uh, convincing uh, architecture. Uh, so, um, you know, I might appear to be, you know, against the T-square and the rectangle, and I am, although I know that architecture uh, did receive some good uh, projects uh, done with the T-square and the rectangle. I'm just saying that it's also very possible to do interesting works without the T-square and the rectangle. That's it. Um, and the problem with the T-square and the rectangle is that you know, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's, it is forcing you, these tools force you to a, a certain vision of architecture and it's not the only valuable vision. There are other possibilities. As Zaha Hadid said, if there are 360 degrees, you know, why are we, we using only one? And I think it's a legitimate question. Although I know Le Corbusier wrote a poem, dedicated a poem to the right angle. But that poem is an esoteric poem, is an al al alchemical poem, is, a, is a, a really a, a mystical poem, actually. Smith's Residence, 1965, another private residence by Arthur Erickson. We already know a little bit his uh, kind of architecture. And uh, of course, the functionalist would protest because why was it needed to, for him to extend these beams? You know, I mean, why? You know, why didn't he arrest it here? Well, I, I think these kind of questions are uh, only in part legitimate. You know, because architecture is also expression, expression, and it also it also. Uh, uh, communicates a desire, a longing for something, maybe to, uh, you know, to extend, to extend at least mentally the house through these suggestions. Uh, and uh, again, you know, architecture is not just function per se, mathematically speaking or uh, prosaically speaking. You know, there are countless superfluous aesthetical gestures in architecture done by countless significant architects. You cannot exclude the superfluous or the capricious from architecture. No, it's impossible. And in fact, ex exactly that, that apparently uh, capricious part of architecture creates the specific flavor of the work. Like these things that we see here, you know, this, uh, if this building was done with timidity and it, it would not have had the same character. And uh, that's why I think it's very important to defend the right to subjectivity in architecture. You cannot exclude and you shouldn't exclude feeling, emotion, subjectivity from architecture. It's impossible on one hand, and on the other hand, it's undesirable. You know, uh, we would just have all the buildings uh, mechanically or uh, mathematically correct, but, but that doesn't make great buildings. Uh, so, uh, you know, like here, why did he extend it 
this way, you know, you could say it was not necessary. And yes, for structural reasons it was not necessary. But for, uh, uh, you know, for the expression of the building, it probably was like here as well, you know, and yeah, the, 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 the accountant of architecture would protest, but the accountant of architecture, I don't think is a great evaluator of architecture. What is this? The Simon Fraser University, 1965, uh, a large uh, building. He had a chance to build both, uh, you know, for private residences and very large educational, uh, uh, you know, uh, complexes like like this one. You know, it's a, it's a massive building uh, that he tried to make less uh, appear less massive by elevating it from the earth from the ground, and uh, I think he did approximately a good job. Um, you, you will see another one. Uh, he, he, I think uh, Arthur Erickson did have a, 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 an appreciation for nature that was not always present in the works of modern architects. You know, he did have it, and maybe that those studies of Asian languages help him in that sense, because it's now that Asia, the Orient, does have a, uh, you know, a warm relationship in general with nature. Now, of course, China is erasing now mountains overnight, but even China has, uh, you know, uh, even a mystic like Lao Tzu who sang the beauty and the, you know, the worth of nature. And, uh, you know, so it, it's a large part of the world, of course, but it is known that in Japan, in China, Southeast Asia, India, uh, you know, uh, other countries there, the relationship with nature is a little bit more sensitive than it is in the West. Uh, and um, I imagine Arthur Erickson, by studying Asian languages, uh, received some suggestions in this sense. I imagine it's a presumption, it's a, it's a you know, uh, maybe even a wishful thinking from my part. But it is a, it is a good building, you know, uh, structurally sound and, uh, you know, almost audacious or horizontal, not to infuriate too much the gods of the sky. Now another house, 1967, this one more adventurous and more flamboyant in a way because of the triangular uh, uh, aspects of it. And again, benefiting from a spectacular uh, landscape. And again, not a very modest house, not a, uh, not, not, not a house for a, you know, a mere proletarian. Uh, but that's what it is. The world is unfair. Uh, there are differences. There are people who are rich and there are people who are poor. What can we do? I mean, we should do something about it, but uh, it seems we have difficulties to create that uh, equality that perhaps would be so nice to create. He did this, the, uh, the Canadian pavilion, uh, this remarkable uh, world exhibition in Osaka from 1970, and apparently he won the top architectural award for it in 1970. Uh, I. I didn't study it very carefully, so I can't truly really explain it in any way. I only look at these pictures just like you do. And uh, I don't know, it is a little bit uh, mysterious because of these reflections, but uh, it doesn't move me very much because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit uh, showy for my taste. But it's possible that the experience there then was uh, positive. And that's why he received the top prize for, for this pavilion in 1970. And there were remarkable buildings in that uh, expo. And I think I am going to show, well, maybe not here. Anyway, um, now I'll show a temple, a temple for, I don't know what religious denomination that is, Khalsa, Divan, Divan Society, I imagine something having to do with the, with the, with the Far East, with, the, with Asia. Um, it's not, in, for me, it's not a building uh, that, that moves me very much, maybe because I don't know the 
specifics of the religious denomination. He tried to, uh, yeah, from here has some qualities, you know, like a citadel, you know, some kind of a fortress of the spirit. But it's a little bit predictable in terms of architectural language. Uh, and uh, anyway, that's what I feel. Uh, University Hall, University of uh, Left Bridge, Alberta, 1971. This is in a dramatic uh, landscape. Uh, I mean, maybe the landscape was, was not so dramatic, but it became dramatic in the dialectics with the building. And I think he did a good job. You know, the, you see clearly the will of man, the university, the building, and then you see the landscape and they complement each other. And indeed they seem to be in a dialectical relationship. Uh, he did a good work here, I think, uh, Arthur, Arthur Erickson. So this is the, the second university campus that we see, we saw uh, done by him and quite large. Well, he benefited in most of his works of a remarkable landscape, as you can see. An elementary school from 1973, um, I, when I presented his work before, I, 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 I commented uh, on, the, on the quality of an education where there are no enclosed rooms, you know, classes, where you have like here an open space. And I said it before, and I will say it again, these children grow up in a, in a, in a space, in an architectural space, which is conducive to dialogue, to being open, to express your ideas, you know, is very different from, let's say, studying in an enclosed space, rectangular enclosed space where you close the door and there you are trapped in your own individuality and uh, egocentric, uh, uh, you know, obsessions. Uh, I think we need more openness. Now, I know the pandemic seems to suggest to kind of uh, return to some kind of enclosed spaces. I don't know, we'll see. But uh, I still think that these children, and look at them, they, look how they lay on the ground in front of the teacher. That shows freedom. That shows lack, lack, lack of inhibition. And I don't think this lack of inhibition means lack of respect. No, it's this, this naturalness, you know, you grow up with it and you develop into a, a citizen of, of a democratic society who is not afraid because, uh, because uh, the spirit is indeed like Walter Gropius said, it works best when it is like an umbrella, meaning open, you know, to have the spirit open uh, is, uh, is um, helped by an architecture that is itself open, like you see here, as opposed to the typical school or university where you have, you know, uh, enclosed uh, classes or rooms on a corridor. This is something very different. And the light comes from above. And so there is, there is an encouragement to, towards, uh, you know, communication, towards being open, towards each other. And this is very important. Uh, education is indeed very important and uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam was correct. The most important thing in a society is education. And look at them. You have children or students or pupils of various ages belonging to various so-called classes all together. Some people there around the table discuss about their matters you know, uh, smaller kids, you know, on the floor playing or discussing, others looking at books. I love this. This is freedom. This is democracy and it works. And you feel like a family. There is no segregation. There is no separation. There is togetherness. And I think we need more of that. We need more togetherness, less frontiers, less separation. Okay, what is this? The Museum of Anthropology is, uh, we, we, you remember the picture of him as a younger man looking at a model. Now you are going to see the building because he built it. 
the Museum of Anthropology, University of British Columbia, 1976. Here it is. I don't know exactly the symbolism of, uh, I imagine he was referring to, you know, some, uh, some uh, you know, these forms are not chosen uh, uh, arbitrarily. I, I think they were chosen uh, in respect with, uh, you know, to, to uh, who knows, the, the local culture, uh, uh, maybe folk culture, mythology, I don't know. But um, especially from the side, uh, there are very, uh, you know, moving uh, uh, pictures. Sorry, my uh, slides don't quite show it yet. But, um, you know, like, again, these, these um, structural elements, uh, the way he, he built them, uh, uh, you know, evoke, uh, because, uh, because I do think that a, a building which does not communicate only, uh, you know, function, function, and again, function, but also has, you know, something mysterious about it. Like here, you know, what, what is the function of these things? You can ask yourself, but you cannot give an answer. But, but the building has presence. And, and uh, uh, again, I repeat myself by quoting from John Ruskin, the most beautiful things in nature are the most useless. And it might be that these are useless, understood in, in terms of a strict uh, uh, functionalism. Now, there is a certain repetitiveness in the system, which could be a little bit oppressive for my taste. There is also a lot of glass, it's true, but this was 1970s. Maybe today we would not employ, although glass is continue, continues to be an obsession with architects. I particularly like this side, side view of this uh, mysterious and uh, powerful, you know, strong uh, sculptural, uh, structural elements. He was an educated man, you know, because if he studied also Asian languages, he immersed himself in other cultures and also in uh, humanistic studies. And I think this is very, very important, you know, for an architect to have a training also in, uh, in, uh, in uh, humanistic uh, disciplines. Now a subway station in Toronto, I know of two that he built, 1978, uh, and the subway station it is, uh, willfully uh, designed and willfully built, but still interesting. And, uh, you know, a subway station is a utilitarian kind of, uh, you know, uh, function, but uh, because of that ceiling, which, uh, which employs those, uh, you know, uh, rebellious diagonals, the space uh, in some places is interesting, like here as well, you know. It, 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 yeah, it's, a, it's a, you know, an utilitarian uh, space, but it is still architectural. It was an architect here who worked. Here is another subway station from, also from Toronto, 1978, different from the previous one. Okay, Evergreen Building, Vancouver, British Columbia, 1978. Now this kind of building today would not surprise us at all, you know, because the plants are climbing on our buildings in, in need for, uh, for us, in need for, uh, you know, more, uh, more oxygen and more vertical forests and so on. I, it's not a, one of my favorite buildings by Arthur Erickson. There is a lot of concrete, it's rather a little bit uh, masculinist in its vigor, but it has the terraces and with the green is, I guess, moderately acceptable. But I still think in the balance between the masculine principle and the feminine principle here, there is more of the principal masculine, the masculine principle, as I call it, or uh, the spirit of geometry, the willfulness of the architect to me is a little bit uh, uh, too present. Uh, but the building doesn't seem to be too subtle for my taste. 
but um, myself, I am subjective. Anyway, um, but still, you know, uh, for the time when it was built, and even now, you know, you might, we might have thought that this building was done by Big, no, by BRK Ingers. No, it was done by Arthur Erickson. And uh, 50 years ago or so. Anyway, uh, this is an important uh, law court or Palais de Justice, uh, Justice Palace. In, um, and the, uh, it's, uh, I see uh, also Vancouver Art Gallery, but the, its main function was the provincial law courts because a uh, doctoral student who presented her work about the uh, palaces of justice uh, presented this work as well. It's a, it's a building that is, uh, its function is, uh, you know, justice, law. And, uh, you know, that, that building, that building, just like in that school that we, we saw earlier, this building has a huge, uh, you know, uh, transparent uh, roofing made of glass. Uh, so the light, abundant light comes from above. The you know, look, the space is very open. So I like to imagine that, uh, you know, uh, you enter this building uh, for a judicial procedure, but because of the space, you imagine that there will be fairness, that it, that it will be a transparent uh, a, a judicial process. And I think that's important. It is important to know that things do not happen be behind closed doors, as the saying goes, you know, it's, it's open, it's transparent, it's democratic, it's just. And uh, for a palace of justice, uh, that is very needed, I would say. In terms of architecture, maybe the, the architectural language is not, uh, you know, alarmingly innovative, if I am to uh, express myself in this way. I'm not a great fan of this kind of, uh, it works, but it's a little bit uh, almost predictable. But still, I think for a tribunal, for a you know a courtroom, for a you know palace of justice, I guess uh, the surprise is that is not you know the typical uh, you know uh, stiff, uh, rigid building like for example Renzo Piano just built a mammoth building in Paris, which is um, crushing the city. It, it's just unbelievable. I'm very surprised that Paris built it, and they did. Now, are there losses of energy here? Of course there are. And, uh, you know, this, um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, again, we have to consider the time when it was built. I personally try to discourage so much usage, usage of glass today. But at that time, probably there was no concern about this. I also like these stairs, you know, these uh, steps done in this way. You have two options, you know, to go slowly and to go quicker. Uh, he employed it in another case, at least, and maybe some other architects employ this, um, you know, this, this, this kind of thing. But uh, yeah, you have again the, 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 the thesis and the anti thesis, you have the two systems, you know, uh, serving the same function, but in a different way. Um, I think it's interesting. Anyway, the Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto, 1982. This is a building that uh, might be famous in Toronto because of its bigness and its centrality, but it's exactly for me uh, a little bit less, um, less enticing. It's very monolithical. Uh, it's huge. I guess, you know, he had to handle, uh, you know, a large number of people to uh, receive them within a kind of a centralized space. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that he began to forget a little bit the lessons of Asia or the le lessons of the Asian languages. But inside there are some interesting things like the big uh, you know, that round thing on the ceiling and it's a huge, it's a huge space. My God, my God. I mean, you know, uh, in the inside perhaps should, uh, uh, should be taken into consideration more than the outside. 
uh, I, I always found a little bit uh, of uh, an excess of commercialism in his work for my taste. But, uh, you know, uh, again, you know, for an architect with his accomplishments and the vastness of his works, I guess a certain level of com commercialism or what we call commercialism cannot be easily avoided. I don't know. Now, NAP Laboratories, Cambridge, England, 1983. Uh, what can we say? Laboratories, uh, glass and, uh, you know, clean lines and, uh, you know, the optimism relating to science and so on. Uh, I don't think it's, I mean, it is okay, but um, King's Landing, Toronto, uh, Ontario, 1984, um, these are uh, apartment buildings, and uh, yeah, sure, um, but again, a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, you know, conveniently terraced in this way. I'm sure it's pleasant to work, to to live in these buildings, but I don't find them, you know. For example, Moshe Safdi with his Habitat 67 was more provocative and more interesting. This one is a little bit. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't think he was, you know, attempting to be adventurous too much in this work. Uh, is it pleasant to live in? I, I, I imagine it is. But the building in terms of architectural language is uh, reducible to concrete, uh, steel and glass. And um, I guess, you know, I guess, but it is a type of architecture which is, uh, you know, can be found in, in other places and by other architects. Canadian Chancery in Washington. This is a governmental building in Washington, D.C., in the United States, and it has some qualities, but again, somewhere, somehow, Arthur Erickson, um, I don't know, forced by the necessities of the program or the or the, the stringencies of the client you know the building for a governmental building is okay but what i find problematic is what's going on here with this uh, you know uh, temple like uh, you know with columns and uh, all in a in a circle and I, I don't know that to me is a little bit you know i mean the building is uh, fresh not, maybe not excessively freshly modernistic, but still modernistic, uh, a modernistic structure. But then he comes in with this thing. Maybe it was required. I, I, I have no idea. But I, I find it a little bit, uh, a little bit problematic. Um, this insertion of, uh, you know, almost a classical kind of uh, uh, architectonic uh, crystallization. You know, uh, here, you know, what is this here? Il Tempieto? Uh, I, I don't know. To me, it's a little bit dissonant, but maybe that dissonance was, uh, is a quality and you have to experience it in that place. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, Civic Center, 1989 in Ontario. And uh, <laughs> a big building again. Uh, he was marked like many other people. Uh, when was it built? Uh, 1989, you know, the deadly, that decade, you know, from 1980 to 1989. So, you know, was governed the world by postmodernism. And even here we see the columns, you know, he didn't have such columns previously in his work. But uh, postmodernism influenced many. Uh, including James Sterling and others uh, almost ruined their career. Again, we see here the same kind of thing. And it, is the, it was the influence of postmodernism. Uh, otherwise, the building could have been, I think uh, this employment of these columns, uh, you know, simplified as they are, um, reduced a little bit the, you know, the freshness or the novelty of the work, in my opinion. But that was the end of, of the 20th century when postmodernism was um, ravishing, you know, freshness in the name of nostalgia and history and looking backward and the past. Anyway, uh, 
yeah another building by uh, by Ericsson, Arthur Ericsson, a convention center in San Diego, uh, California. This one, though, I find it more uh, uh, engaging and uh, mysteriously challenging because I don't know exactly what's going on in these cylinders, in these horizontal cylinders, in these tubes, and it looks futuristic. You know, it looks almost, uh, you know, alien somehow. And uh, I think he was more adventurous here for some reason, and it paid, I think. But I don't know again what's going on in these uh, horizontal um, cylinders. What is, even though I'm not a functionalist, I am asking myself, what is their function? What, what, what are they made for? There might be a reason, a raison d'etre for them. Otherwise, again, a lot of glass glass and again glass but there is also uh, the drama uh, sculpturalness and now the fresno city hall in uh, fresno california 1991 la another large building by arthur erickson what is its function a city hall so i guess he was uh, convincing for the mayors you know they commissioned him large buildings you know imposant uh, uh, this one almost monolithic. There is some kind of, I hope I have a picture of the model to see where he tried to, uh, you know, problematize the, the monolith uh, by, um, you know, uh, you see this cut into the monolith, uh, you know, uh, softens, so to speak, through, through contrast. The, you know, the, the overwhelming monolithic quality of the work. Uh, what is this? University of California. I still prefer the, the universities he built in, uh, in, uh, in, in Canada. We see again the same kind of arrangement with the, with the stairs, which is an interesting idea if it is done once, but when it's done several times, uh, you begin to... <laughs> to be less surprised, so to speak. And the building itself, um, it's stylish, but uh, less, less fresh, in my opinion, compared to his uh, earlier works for universities. Now, these are two skyscrapers in Los Angeles, 1992, uh, and, uh, you know, glass, glass, and glass again. This is the name of the game, glass. Glass and, and tallness, what can you do? Uh, I mean, you could do something, but uh, are they okay? They are okay. Uh, do they uh, care about energy consumption? Of course not. But at that time, okay, let's say the world was not preoccupied with that. But do you see any open window here, all these towers? No, no, because, because it's undesirable even, you know, you pump, you know, uh, the required air into the whole building. You can imagine what an infernal machinery you need for that, you know, and what expenditures as well. Anyway, the fascination with, gra with, with glass, not with grass. Uh, a library, 1997, glass here again, and not grass. Um, Arthur Erickson, where is it? Uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Now, glass is not the, you know, the, the material to truly uh, you know, please the books, because the books in a library are, are not very, very uh, you know, uh, appreciative for uh, sunlight or sun rays to reach them. Uh, with this problem, uh, Dominique Perrault was uh, confronted too in his Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris, where he also created huge surfaces of glass, and then he needed the oblongs inside to stop so much natural light to reach the books, because the paper is very sensitive to, to sunlight and uh, natural light. Anyway, waterfall building, what is this, 2001? Another building, uh, this one has some interesting things uh, because of these stairs that you see here emerging from the, the apartments at the top and going to the terrace. Um, they create a little bit of drama there at the top and we all like a little bit of drama. 
you know, otherwise the buildings, yeah, they are okay, of course, you know, we have a, a concrete uh, structure and we have, um, you know, the windows, uh, glass, but these stairs, you know, uh, yes, of course, they add it to the cost of the building, but uh, aesthetically, they create a difference, uh, something more special. And I think at least sometimes we all like uh, you know, some surprises or something a little bit different. Uh, what is this uh, Heritage Center? I think his later work is not so good as, as, the, as the, his later work than, than the earlier one. Like this building, for example, is uh, rather, well, I guess he was growing older and less uh, adventurous, less rebellious, although this corner you might think that belongs to a rebel. Apparently so, you know, like Christian de Portson Park in Luxembourg. But uh, yeah, if you make abstraction of this, uh, you know, ex exalted uh, little corner, uh, the building is, you know, another building, I would say. Anyway, Museum of Glass. Uh, this one in Washington, uh, USA, uh, is kind of interesting. And again, referring to the peacock's tail, the most beautiful things are the most useless. I don't know. I mean, this is the museum of glass, and glass it is. But what is the function of these uh, panels of glass? I have no idea. Let, let me see uh, here. I have no idea. <laughs> you know, I mean, they are glass for all to see. But uh, some kind of uh, architectural ornamentation in three dimensions, or I, I don't know. Um, it's, you know, because of this piece, it's uh, rather interesting, but not alarmingly so. Um, it's okay. It's a muse the Museum of Glass. Here we have glass in a different kind of arrangement. Uh, and uh, yeah, when he becomes playful, uh, I think he's at his best. Uh, and um, now it's, uh, it's true, you wonder what happens to this glass when there is a rain, like we had in Bucharest just uh, one hour and a half ago. Um, I guess that, that glass is stronger than the strongest steel. It's very possible because uh, technology creates uh, unbelievable things sometimes. Um, yeah, so this is in Washington, D.C., the Museum of Glass by Arthur Erickson. And we are approaching the end of this presentation. I think at the very end is, uh, you know, uh, his proposal for a Trump Tower. Yes, I'm talking about uh, Donald Trump, the former president of the United States. Well, we are still uh, contemplating the Museum of Glass in Washington, D.C., and glass it is for all to see. Uh, Canada House in Vancouver, uh, but no pictures. Now the Ericsson Vancouver, what is this? Now, I guess I didn't find pictures for these two works, but I found for the Trump International Hotel and Tower, Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, I don't think it was built from 2016. Here it is, twisted, as many buildings today are. You know, I even have a presentation about twisted architectures. Why are we twisting them? Maybe in this case, because Donald Trump was twisting truth. <laughs> I am malicious, but maybe not totally incorrect. Anyway, the tower for Mr. Trump, and it was not uh, built as far as I know, or yet. Although here, I'm confused. This one seems to, to say that it was built. But sometimes renderings are so perfect that you know uh, you could swear that it was built when in fact it was not. Personally, I don't really care I, if it was built or not. We ha I have seen such buildings before, uh, before Arthur Erickson. So uh, you know, one you know uh, more or one less is not really um, you know a major issue. Here it is. The Trump, uh, the Trump Tower, uh, international, of course, it had to be international in Vancouver by Arthur Erickson. And I think the last image of this presentation is with a poster I made 
uh, when I uh, presented the work of a um, Romanian architect who uh, lived in, uh, in Montreal in Canada as an immigrant and uh, you know, became a force in architecture there. And that is Dan Hanganu. Uh, and I love this building by Dan Hanganu. I will not make a presentation about Dan Hanganu now, but I thought because he truly uh, arrived at uh, significant accomplishments uh, in architecture, uh, more as far as I know from any other Romanian architect. And here he is still before uh, leaving the country, before leaving Romania. I like his winter coat and I like the way he looks and romantic and, uh, you know, uh, I know, I know, I know, it's nostalgia, but uh, this building that uh, Hangano built, I like very much because of its modesty and a certain influence coming from Scandina the Scandinavians, perhaps a certain reticence. Uh, uh, he was dealing with um, an existing situation and across the street, there is a celebrated museum uh, of the beginning of uh, the city of Montreal that he built, but this for another time when I guess in October, yeah, in October, it will be his birthday, I think, or the day when he died. So on the 18th of October, God willing, uh, we'll meet again and we'll talk about uh, Dan Hangan. And now we'll, we'll go to the second architect we'll talk about today, and that is Kevin Roach. Uh, just a second, because I think, uh, okay, uh, Kevin Roach, uh, who received the Pritzker, the, um, you know, the irreplaceable uh, prize in architecture. Uh, and let's see, Kevin Roach. Uh, let's read a little bit about him. Uh, Eamon Kevin Roach, uh, born June 14th, just like Arthur Erickson, was an Irish-born American Pritzker Prize winner architect. He has been responsible for the design master planning for over 200 built projects in both the United States and abroad. These projects include eight museums, 38 corporate headquarters, seven research facilities, performing arts centers, theaters, and campus buildings for six universities. In 1967, the, he created the master plan for the Metropolitan Museum of Art and henceforth designed all of the new wings and installation of many collections, including the recently reopened American and Islamic wings. So we can only say, wow. Born in Dublin and a graduate from University College, Roach uh, went to the United States to study with Ludwig Miss van der Rohe at the Illinois Institute of Technology. In the United States, he became the principal designer for Eero Sarinen and opened his own architectural firm in 1967. Among other awards, Roach received the Pritzker in 1982, the Gold Medal Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 1990, and the AIA Gold Medal in 1993. So indeed, a very accomplished architect. I like this picture of him, you know, uh, maybe he was still in Dublin, maybe not, but um, he looks like, a, you know, a descendant of Faust you know, the European quintessential intellectual reading and maybe also drinking. I see the glass with some, uh, uh, you know, uh, angelic uh, liquid in it perhaps, but I like his expression and uh, I like these photographs. What can I do? Uh, here he is in his uh, older age and I like, him the, I like him in this picture as well. Uh, and he, uh, he looks a little bit, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, whimsical and uh, it's something about him that makes me uh, a little bit wonder, but uh, no, he was without doubt a, a remarkable man. Now I don't like this picture of him, you know, it's, uh, it's too cocky here, you know, it's too, too much of the, the architect who made it, you know like uh, Sir Norman Foster, you know, uh, uh, finding support, uh, you know, in one of his um, tall buildings in London or uh, 
you know, like this man is sitting on a building or I don't know, they, they, this kind of uh, hum so-called humorous uh, pictures, um, I don't appreciate too much. Here he is, uh, you know, as a distinguished recipient of some award. I don't know if this is the Pritzker, probably not, but the colors made me think of Ukraine. Uh, God help them. Uh, Kevin Roach and Don Jink uh, John Dinkaloo, they were together. Uh, this partnership was very successful. Uh, actually, I should make a presentation about John Dinkaloo too, but I, I, um, I, I neglected until now. Here they are on the left, uh, uh, John Roach, uh, and on the right, uh, John uh, Dinkaloo. They they built, uh, they built a lot. I like the expression of, uh, of, uh, of John Roach, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, skeptical and uh, maybe even looks a little bit tired of life. A Catholic capitalism, I, 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 I put these two words together there with a, with a question mark, because could we have a cath Catholic capitalism? You know, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know why I thought of it. No, be, because he was a Catholic, you know, he, he came from Ireland, uh, but he was also a capitalist. He was serving, you know, capitalism with all his forces. Um, Ford Foundation in New York, a famous work by him. And the good work is this building here, you know, and here is, of course, a Chrysler building, uh, but that is not by him. But this is the Ford Foundation. And, uh, you know, this atrium uh, inside is, uh, is spectacular and probably, you know, uh, very useful in terms of the quality of, uh, you know, uh, vision, but also air, although, you know, uh, uh, it was an expensive thing to do, you know, to, instead of maximizing the office space, he ate up, look, all this building, you know, all, all this space is actually a huge atrium which is, uh, you know, the beneficial uh, capriciousness of the architect. And I'm very happy that he had it, you know, and that he was allowed to have it. But you have to understand, there was all the money in the world here because this was Ford. Now, none other than Ford. Instead of saying, oh, Lord, we could very well say, oh, Ford. You know, Ford re almost replaced God. So look, this building is eroded at its core in order to accommodate, uh, you know, a large atrium with trees and so on. It's nice, no, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you have to be a Lord, meaning a Ford, in order to afford this. But it's a good building, yeah, it is. And lucky those who work there. The Ford Foundation by, uh, <clears throat> uh, John Roach, uh, Kevin Roach, and John Dinkel. Because buildings, as you know, are not only about what they are, but they, they are also about, about they are not, what they are not. And here, you know, is the presence of absence, is the presence of this atrium, which, you know, uh, more, uh, less adventurous and less lucky architect would have covered every floor, you know, with offices. Now he, he eroded the building with uh, this uh, Edenic, uh, uh, you know, uh, landscape, uh, interior landscape. And uh, yeah, it is impressive, but uh, again, you need a Ford, meaning a Lord in order to do this. Can you imagine this, uh, you know, uh, uh, CEOs and uh, high-ranking officials of the, this uh, uh, firm, you know, working in such an environment must be very pl pleasing. Although I'm not sure that on those shelves, you, you, you know, you found books by Heidegger or Nietzsche, but that doesn't matter really. Look at it. Inside at the core of uh, the, you know, of, of the building that had at its origin the T model by Ford, you know, uh, and let there be light, God might have said, but God would have said also, let there be the T model. And the T model is now covering the world, you know, uh, under different names, of course. Um, yeah, anyway, 
no, I don't like him here, convention center in Dublin. Now this is a rather burlesque building, you know. Uh, I don't know, do I like it? Of course not. Uh, it's, 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 it's Kevin Roach at his worst, you know, uh, being, uh, maybe he drank, drank when he designed this building. Uh, it's unnecessarily flamboyant and that huge piece there plus, you know, breaking the building in two is, uh, I, I find it cheap actually, sorry for being brutal, but uh, it leaves me cold. Uh, this is not, uh, this is not in my opinion, a major architecture, but I think, you know, he, you know, he was able, I'm not, I think, I know he was able to build it. So bravo to him. But the Oakland Museum of California, this is something else. It actually, uh, it amazes me that the man who did this, which in my opinion is not a sign of great sophistication or sensibility, did this work, the Oakland, Oakland Museum in California, which I, which I like it very much because you know how many museums look like this? You know, it's almost like a park. It's like a garden. Yes, you have platforms of, uh, of uh, concrete, but the museum disappears, to use the words of, uh, of the architect we talked about yesterday, Emilio Ambash, we have green over gray. And that's exactly what we have here, green over gray. And I think he did it more uh, uh, sensitively than uh, what um, uh, Emilio Ambash did. And, you know, look at this, it's a labyrinth. Where is the museum? Well, it is a museum. But I like very much this uh, fragmentation of the museum. It's not any longer monolithic, overwhelming, centralized, it's dispersed. And uh, I, I, I think he did an excellent job here. Even if, yes, he used concrete, what can you do? You know, you have to build up something, uh, some materials. And at that time, people didn't think of pollution too much. But when I look at this picture, I see a uh, right balance between uh, l'esprit de geometry and l'esprit de finesse, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of fineness. Uh, and look at the plan. I think it is excellent, you know, and uh, even as a graphic work, I would anytime hang this on the wall. You know, it's, where is the museum? Uh, in my opinion, is one of the best museums that I ever saw. And this is by Kevin Roach. I don't know if at that time he still worked with uh, John Dinkelow, probably. Essentially is, uh, you know, an artificial hill in a way, underneath is the museum and above, you know, this uh, landscaping, which is done uh, with vigor, but also with some sensitivity is based on, uh, is based on geometry in my opinion, is actually better than a work, uh, uh, it's not a museum, a work by Tadao Ando where he incarcerated plants, flowers uh, in, uh, you know, uh, square concrete containers, but they, it's very, you know, very restrictive. And here is not, you look at this, it's, there are a variety of spaces here and, uh, you know, uh, it, it, there is a certain degree of freedom, which I like, and even of mystery, graphic mystery and architectural mystery. Although the scheme is essentially rectangular. I wish I had better pictures. And I wish, yes, uh, these uh, open spaces like this courtyard had also more plants and less, um, you know, whatever it is, concrete or some kind of stone. Um, but but they, all in all, the, the scheme, I think, is good. Aetna Life and Casualty Company, uh, Computer Headquarters, Hartford, 1969. Computer Headquarters, 1969. You know, uh, this was uh, almost 60 years ago. And, uh, you know, the building makes you think of IMPAI. I mean, this kind of architecture was done by various architects in the United States. Kevin Roach was not the only one, but he was one of the, I would say one of the convincing one, the good ones. And even this building, it could have been some kind of a mausoleum or some kind of a, 
you know, a museum, you know, headquarters of computer, whatever. But it is, it has a certain monumentality that is appreciable, I would say. The Power Center for the Performing Arts, University of Michigan, 1971. We see they were kind of at the same time, Arthur Erickson and Kevin Roach. This one also has some qualities, you know. I mean, yes, there are these columns, but they are so abstracted. I mean, they are round and they are so monumental that they somehow transcend an easy reference to historical styles, um, or almost, not totally, but maybe almost. It's, it's okay, I think, or almost okay, if I am to be a little bit more rigorous towards myself towards what I say. Kevin Roach, a uh, huge space again. I mean, maybe not huge, but big. Now this one is a little bit different. Uh, first of all, the, the name Knights, you know, not the Knights of the Apocalypse that uh, the former president of Russia you know, alarmingly, uh, you know, reminded uh, Europe of, uh, you know, marching. I, I truly hope Russia will not uh, start a nuclear war with, with Europe, although they, they keep, uh, they keep uh, sending very alarming uh, messages. But well, the Knights of Columbus, uh, some kind of a business, big business, a big corporation, the Knights of Columbus, the headquarters. And look at it. It's, um, you know, proudly so, maybe too proudly so, but architecturally, we could say it does have force. He also designed the, the, the horizontal building nearby uh, and this vertical one, uh, and, you know, destined for knights, it is, look at the plan. Look at the plan, you know, it's, um, it's um, emphatic. It is emphatic, and I think it works, actually, in its uh, prismatic, uh, uh, you know, uh, purity, so to speak. Now, it's very possible that here in these towers, the serving towers, to use the words of, uh, of Louis Kahn, there are also the restrooms, you know, even though some schools of thought uh, think that uh, toilets or restrooms should not be placed towards the outside of the building. But I think that's what they are. Where else could they be? Around the staircase, uh, <laughs> monumentalized, after all. Uh, why not? Anyway, it is, a, you know, a conceptually, it is a very strong statement and uh, it's a fortress now, the Knights of Columbus, uh, the, the capital of uh, Ohio. I, has, I spent some hours there and one day I will tell you the story about it. Um, I was the victim of uh, clear discrimination because I was white. And um, it's a long story, I will not tell you now, but Columbus uh, could be very, very depressing. I walked for a few miles without seeing uh, almost anyone on sidewalks, only, you know, uh, deserted stores and uh, maybe a drunken person and cars, cars, cars and cars again. So we should not be misled by some so-called masterpieces that we see published in magazines or on Zoom. Uh, uh, Zoom presentations. The reality of a city is much more complex. And, uh, but uh, the building built by, or the buildings, because he built also this one, uh, has some qualities. And uh, even during the, you know, the, you know, the coming together of the building, uh, the, the conceptual clarity uh, has, uh, has, uh, has virtues, has qualities. And, you know, North American capitalism, you know, at its most uh, obvious, so to speak. But this building, the horizontal building, I think was demolished, uh, which is sad, um, you know, because 
you know, is it sustainable to destroy such a building? I read that recently the capsule tower by uh, Kisho Kurokawa was destroyed in, in, in Tokyo, uh, another crime against sustainability. You know, we build things, they are still functioning and we destroy them. You know, uh, it's uh, almost unacceptable. Um, so Kevin Roach and John Dinkelu, uh, the temples of consumption. Uh, I think I, uh, I wrote these words. Indeed, they, they were temples, they are temples of consumption. And you see what happened to uh, part of the temples of consumption, meaning to one temple of consumption was, was uh, you know, uh, was destroyed to make room for something else. I don't know what. Anyway, um, but the, you know, the main or the tower uh, of the Knights of, uh, of Columbus is still standing. Now, US Postal Office. Now, you tell me how many, you, how many postal offices in the world look like this? Even in the United States, and it is huge in, indeed. But also it has a plethora of um, unnecessary spaces. I mean, no, I should not say so. I actually find them, uh, they bring quality to the work. But here there are plenty of spaces that one would certainly not associate with the postal office. You know, like, uh, you know, it, it could have been anything else, a museum, a university, uh, you know, uh, Anything, but not a, a postal service. And but by the way, of the postal service in the United States, I, I purchased some uh, architecture magazine magazines uh, detail on eBay, and they were shipped from Florida to Chicago, and from there they were supposed to be sent to Romania, and they never they, they never arrived. You know, they never arrived in one month. Uh, so I recuperated the money, but the, the magazines got lost, you know, in the country which claims that is still leading the world. Well, let me tell you, the postal service in the United States is terrible, absolutely terrible. This kind of building, it was uh, an exception. And uh, even if you have a glorious building, doesn't mean that the service is glorious. But I, this building has qualities as an architecture, but I almost uh, regret it is only a postal office here. The College Life Insurance Company headquarters and other headquarters in response to a growing company's request for office space, Kevin Roach and John Dinkelu and associates developed a master plan that would allow the incremental addition of floor space over time. The initial design included nine identical buildings arranged in a parallelogram to totaling 1.2 million square feet, not bad. Only three of the buildings, I mean, <laughs> I was a little bit sarcastic, I mean, not bad in the sense that they're quite a big uh, uh, investment. Only three of the buildings were constructed in the initial phase and the expansion plan was never fulfilled. The trio is known as the pyramids for the simple geometry and slanting glass facades. Here they are, and pyramids they are. They only build three. And what was the function for uh, the college life? Of course, an insurance company. That's where the money is. They, they are the pharaohs of today. The, the, insurance, the insurance companies, we don't need Ramses, um, uh, Amenhotep and things like this. We have the insurance companies. They are the pharaohs of capitalism. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't uh, move me a lot, this kind of architecture. Maybe, maybe if all of them were built, uh, the effect would have been a little bit more complex. Maybe, I think I have a site plan here with the original scheme, uh, but it's still a kind of a simplistic architecture. But doing well, these uh, insurance companies, are they not? They are, they indeed are. Well, what can we do? You know, uh, this is capitalism. Uh, it had its successes and we, now we pay for those successes.
the three pyramids. I hope I really hope I have the, ah, uh, yeah, this is the scheme. Uh, only three were built, but he proposed nine. Almost a city, you no, know, a city of pyramids. Wow, I don't really like it. Actually, you know, uh, sometimes I ask, why did uh, Kevin Roach receive the Pritzker? I think that museum uh, in Oakland, California uh, was good, but um, otherwise, you know, most of his works are flamboyantly celebrating um, not a Catholic capitalist, but capitalist, that's it. Look at it, you know, the schemata, the scheme, tiring. This is the plan. <laughs> wow. You know, I mean, do we need insurance companies? You know, you turn on the radio or the TV and what do you hear? Are you over 50? Are you insured? You are not insured. You are not insured. So fear is instilled in you. And then trembling, you go to the, to the place where you have the money. You take it and you rush to the insurance company and invest it in your future, which is limited anyway, because the fatality of what we call the end of life. St. Nicholas Orthodox Church, it's an Orthodox Church, Ground Zero, New York City. Uh, it's not the one designed by Calatrava and built, and I don't know if this was built or just a project. And, uh, yeah, I, although I'm an Orthodox uh, myself, if I am to describe myself so, I despise these buildings which refuse to be more creative. I, I just, uh, the dogmatic aspect of Orthodox uh, uh, architecture disappoints me very much. And I see even Kevin Roach couldn't do anything about it, you know. I mean, <laughs> It's the same now, uh, depressing. In my sorry, I know maybe at this very moment God is planning some some you know punishment for what I'm saying, but I, I it doesn't move me this kind of building. I'm I'm very sorry. Uh, it, it, it doesn't. He tried to be creative, but you can tell he was not free, uh, and. Um, uh, maybe the insurance companies offer him more freedom than uh, than the Orthodox Church. I, I'm almost sure of it. Anyway, the Orthodox Church by Kevin Roach and uh, John Dinkelu. Fine Arts Center, University of Massachusetts, uh, 1974. Yeah, he was at his best when he had, uh, you know, a uh, modernist uh, architectural language without uh, any kind of ideology beyond that. Like here, you know, it's okay, it's still a little bit simplistic, but, but because of the lack of either, you know, capitalistic ideology or the orthodox religious ideology, here is just, uh, you know, the the architectural uh, uh, you know, crystallization of uh, some functions that had to be served. And I, I, I like buildings which are not, uh, you know, excessively, you know, polished or like here, you know, you see, okay, it's almost a brutalist building. It's okay, life is brutalist too, isn't it? Very often. Uh, and, uh, No, some of these buildings really do have qualities, you know, uh, uh, even in pictures black and white, maybe even more in, in pictures black and white. The Center for the Arts. Wesleyan University, 1973. This one also, you know, it's uh, apparently misanthropically, uh, you know, oriented towards the outside. Uh, but uh, I do think it has qualities uh, as architecture. You know, it's it's uh, it's massive, it's fortress-like, 
it has a level of, uh, you know, I would say sincere, uh, uh, of sincerity, yeah. And against the background of architecture, the trees are even more uh, lovable and, and magnificent. What if we make an architecture which is just that, a background on which nature uh, asserts herself even more beautifully? Now, the jo this is not a bad building. John Deere uh, World Headquarters is uh, this is a manufacturer of uh, you know uh, machineries I understood very valued machineries uh, i don't have a lot of knowledge in this field 1978 uh, and um, i hope i have better pictures yeah uh, i i like this um, corten or whatever it is this rusted uh, iron and also the the insertions of nature within the building uh, but I'm not happy with the, yeah, you can see a little bit here, perhaps this patina of the, of the, the aged steel, I think is, is good. And um, also, you know, it, it's, and, and it shows the, the versatility of uh, Kevin Roach that compared to the building that we just saw that for that college, you know, here we have a different kind of architecture you know, uh, metallic, open towards the outside, uh, different uh, color scheme, um, interesting, you know. Uh, of course, there was all the money in the world. This is a very established uh, firm. Uh, I hope I have a picture with some of the products. It's also where, where, you, have, uh, where you have the dialectics, the chromatic dialectics, like the green of nature, and then this uh, rusted uh, iron, uh, uh, you know, color, uh, you know, it's almost a kind of a reddish, uh, brownish reddish uh, uh, versus um, the green. And this creates a dynamic uh, uh, configuration, a dynamic uh, encounter. Now here, you know, that rusted iron is not so rusted, but uh, otherwise the plan is, uh, what can we say? You know, a big uh, headquarters. Again, it's a headquarters, nothing less. But there are complexities on this facade. As you can see, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, a banal uh, steel and glass uh, um, elevation. A gray landscape, you know, these headquarters uh, have all the money in the world and they can purchase uh, vast uh, areas of land and build whatever they want to build. Yeah, another headquarters, this time in Spain, Madrid. This one, uh, <laughs> you know, different from the previous one, isn't it? You know, uh, I guess in Europe, we remember his Bonanza building at convention center in Dublin. Now we see what he did in Madrid. It became a little bit different in Europe. Uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, it is flamboyant, but it's not, you know, totally without interest. I would say this building. He had his moments of flamboyance, and uh, those moments uh, do pop up from time to time. Like here, you know, for example, I mean, yes, we, we love curves and we love uh, fluidities, but uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, there is a level of exaltation here, which to me seems to be a little bit... Uh, overdone. And I'm not against exaltation, far from it. But uh, I, I'm also not against uh, some kind of uh, an harmony or uh, balance. Well, I guess inside also we have these, uh, you know, moments of architectonic uh, exaltation. 
another headquarters, this time in Madrid. And yes, uh, the art gallery, some beautiful artworks for, uh, if I am not mistaken. Um, by the way, if you arrive in Madrid, my strongest, most powerful, most emotional encounter with painting in a museum was with the black paintings of uh, Goya at La Prado. Unbelievable. I, I was shocked when I saw them. So please don't forget Goya, the black paintings at the Prado in, in, in Madrid. Now this one, what is it? Uh, RIT administration building. I don't know where it is uh, built. Another citadel, because that's what uh, North American universities are. They are, you know, uh, places of privilege outside of cities most of the time. And uh, you, 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 you study there in, in perfect conditions, but misleading, misleadingly perfect, because what you learn there and, and, and the, 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 the environment in which you learn is not the environment of cities. It's um, on one hand, uh, maybe it's good that it is so. On the other hand, not so much so because you uh, you you grow up intellectually with a, with a, with a certain assumption which is not honored afterwards because living in a city is different from living outside of the city in these uh, you know uh, spaces of privilege. But uh, Kevin Roach did the right thing. Uh, we saw this on the Knights of Columbus, that is for Papal visit. Now, this is, uh, I guess the Pope visited, but I see in the Knights of Columbus, we saw the building. This was just the stage design he did for the arrival. I told you this man was a Catholic. He was Irish and uh, you know, the Irish are Catholics. So of course he designed the big headquarters for the, um, you know, big uh, uh, capitalistic uh, uh, you know, investment companies, but he also designed uh, for the Pope, you know, I guess to cleanse himself in terms of, uh, you know, religiosity or whatever. I don't know. Maybe this was also some kind of a bonanza. Sorry for my uh, uh, maliciousness. What is this? A skyscraper, I guess. And a skyscraper it is. And uh, not too without some interest because of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, fragmentation in a way. It's, it's, um, it's not so usual to see a skyscraper done in this way. And I don't think it's too bad, you know, it's okay. It's still a commercial structure. But uh, it has a little bit of uh, dynamic quality. And yes, the, <laughs> the Coke is there and other, other things of that sort because New York City uh, you know, cannot, uh, cannot live without these immense, immense banners. Kevin Roach and John Dinkelow. That's it. Sorry about this. This was a presentation uh, that had two architects on that day, but we end. We end now. So let's wish happy birthday to John, uh, to uh, not to John, to Arthur uh, Erickson and uh, to Kevin Roach. Thank you.